July 23rd, Sheffield, England, the 1991 World Student Games. In the long jump, Great Britain's hopes lay with Fiona May. Her achievements so far include a sixth place in the Seoul Olympics. Today, the main opposition was from the Russian, Aresa Kravitz, in the lead with 6.87 metres. Fiona lies second with 6.67 metres and one jump left. Well, the World Student Games was very important for me, especially to win the gold medal. On that day, I thought I felt good before I actually competed, but during the competition, I knew it wasn't my day. There were a lot of faults, um, a lot of mistakes that I made, but I, I, I look at it in, in a more positive way now. I think that, you know, you live and learn your mistakes. It's four months later. Fiona starts her winter training at Thorns Park Wakefield. A training session is being set up by Jonathan Rosenthal, her coach, and Drew Harrison. He has analysed Fiona's Sheffield performance from video pictures Mathsphere specially recorded for him. The camera was set at right angles to the takeoff board. Our aim is to do some basic distance measurements frame by frame. We know how far apart the frames are in time. And from simple calculations of distance divided by time, we can get velocity. We've got some you shots have from World Student Games. Games. If you can just come around and have a look at them, you can see the procedure that we go through is to make a stick figure up from your uh, long jump. And Rachel's now storing some of the data, just to let you see it. And then after she's stored every frame, we can do a full analysis to find out how efficient you were. Yeah. Your best jump was number five, uh, six metres 67. You see how far behind the board that is. That sort of lost the gold medal, that, <laughs> that distance. It did. And the, the news is that you were uh, far enough behind the plasticine there for you to have, if you'd have been spot on, you'd have been 6 metres 88. Yeah. That's what our calculations were. That would have got yeah. the gold medal. That would have well, got the gold medal. That's the way it goes. Mm. So you took off there. Took to off Jonathan, there. taking off before the board was an obvious problem. However, Drew's analysis went further than this. The graph shows Fiona's speed measured against time. Can you describe what happens to her speed during the jump? Drew's attention was drawn to the moment of takeoff. But the most interesting factor that came out was really that she was losing a lot of this velocity into the board. Mm. And, and some of her calculations indicate that she could hit about nine metres per second at, at best. Mm. Yeah. Before the board, and just at takeoff, she was coming down sometimes to about less than seven metres per second. Mm. Oh, no. mm. Now, that's a massive drop. And on average, oh. well, the, the range of, of loss is from about 16, 17% down to up to 23, 24% of your velocity. <laughs> It's, now, it's, it's, you'll, you'll know yourself that it doesn't matter how fast you are in the runway, it's how fast you are when you take, take off, off that board. Yeah. What's Fiona feeling about all this? It makes me slightly, slightly a bit sick and thinking, well, why have I wasted this season for not jumping seven, seven metres or seven metres plus? And due to my technique, just see if you can hit the board from there. Just see where you, where yeah, you are roughly. Pick your knees up and speed it up. But what's wrong with Fiona's technique that makes her slow down so much at takeoff? A closer look at the video suggested the reason. What we found is that, and the graphs show it, is that as you come in in your last stride, you're not bending your knee and taking off. You're actually blocking the takeoff with a straight knee. Mm. Right? Well, maybe you're it's because I have a long leg. stride. I've got a very long yeah, stride. And a that's long why. stride, reaching with and a straight leg. Off. You can see just at that point, now that's blocking the takeoff. That so basically, we're looking it. for Fiona to paw the ground and yes. pull the ground back. That's a continuation of the running. Running, that's, yeah. That's a continuation of the running. Whereas what you're doing is a, is a, a run and a little stop. stop. With so much analysis, does Fiona feel it's taking the fun out of her sport? It doesn't take the fun out of it. The analysis is useful as well as fascinating. It might be going in a bit too deep, but at least I know the background and know exactly what I should do. The higher level you get up to, the more scientific it will become. There's no reason why she shouldn't be up there with everybody thinking, who's going to beat Fiona May? I feel pleased within myself, thinking, well, 
that's my potential now. Let's see if I can do it. So that's the next challenge. Colin McKenzie wants to compete in the Barcelona Games. Just getting through the selection trials, he'll have to throw 80 metres. Building up to that, his physical training concentrates on that one massive instant burst of power. All the rest hangs on his technique. To sharpen his technique, Collins turned to biomechanics. He's enlisted the help of an assortment of poles, two high-speed cameras and a stick man. Biomechanics is a way of using high-speed film and computers to analyse technically an athlete's every move. Today is a follow-up to the biomechanics team's first look at Colin last year. They begin their analysis by plotting the exact position of that grid of poles into their computer. That maps out in the computer the space where Colin will be throwing. Then they plot Colin's own position throughout the throw, marking his body and javelin in every frame of the film. That's 236 frames and 236 positions for every throw. All that plotting allows the computer to make a simple but very accurate stick model. This is Colin's throw at the Three Age Championships. And the first thing I think I noticed was the tendency of the right arm to bend very early. Were you aware of that? Too much? Well, right. not at the time, no. OK, well, that seems to bend excessively. 103. 103. You need to keep that arm straighter, back for longer, to get more power actually into the uh, release phase. Is there any way of looking at this now from perhaps another, another viewpoint uh, to see if the arm comes wide from the body? By having two cameras shooting each throw simultaneously, Dr Bartlett can create a 3D view of the thrower, which they can then inspect from all directions. To the right arm all the time. So, instead of this sort of position, it needs to be in what sort yeah, of Yeah, we need to be a little bit higher there, so your arms are in a high position ready to yeah. strike. Drop the elbow, and then we can follow through from there now. Keep it high. That's good. A lot better. Excellent. When they studied Steve Backley, the current world record holder, they were able to pick out the small differences in technique that give him the edge. Okay, you notice how much straighter the right elbow is than it was for, for Colin. Yeah. If we hold it there, you can see an arch position, which gi gives a power band so that he can really punch and hit the jab in really hard. So, ideally, the sort of position I need to be in is something like... That's right. How does, how does that feel, Colin? Very awkward and <laughs> Well, they're great graphics, but is it any use? Colin, what do you think? It's great. Uh, being able to see yourself in a different throwing form. And you, Tim? One more throw, Colin. Okay. One more. Yeah, what it does enable you to do is see different angles, which you wouldn't normally see, just looking from video or from the sidelines. So do you think on the strength of this, you might change Colin's technique? Yeah, we already have. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of athletes' technique is developed in the lab. There they can test most precisely which of the body's two main sources of energy an athlete is using. And that knowledge is what helps break records. This is Brian. How's it going? <laughs> Brian Rittle runs 800 metres, and he's one of our best hope for a track medal in Barcelona this summer. He's been running here at a moderate pace, but let's make him work a little bit harder. Pump it up there. Now, to figure out which energy system Brian's using, we've wired him up to keep an eye on his heart rate, and he's breathing through a tube so that we can calculate how much oxygen he's using. Now, at the lower level, he, Brian is exercising entirely on the aerobic energy system. That uses oxygen he consumes to burn the fats and carbohydrates stored in his body. Aerobic energy will fuel hours of steady exercise, but it's not powerful enough for sprints or even fast finishers. Now, this is where we turn the level up 
and you can see that. And you can see here on the screen that first, he's going faster when he uses more oxygen. But even though he's still running faster, the oxygen consumption, he keeps going, should generally tail off, level off around here somewhere. And if we let him keep going for long enough, he will do that. Now, to keep pace, keep the body pace that high, he switches over to a, a kind of emergency energy system that doesn't depend on oxygen. And it's this anaerobic system that gives athletes the power to surge and sprint. But it also produces a chemical called lactic acid, which accumulates in the muscles and makes it really painful to continue. In fact, I better stop that now. You want to stop that? Now, even Brian can only exercise anaerobically for a minute or so. Is that OK, Brian? Not too bad, <laughs> but it's all very relevant. Right, thank you very much. Now, you see, learning what the switch from aerobic to anaerobic energy feels like on a treadmill can be really useful out on the track. And we're actually going to take a look now at one of Brian's races and see how it actually works in practice. Yes, we're going to take a look at the 800 metres semi-final in the last Commonwealth Games. Uh, there's Brian. In fact, he was on the inside lane in this instance. Now, on the left of the screen, you'll see Brian's heart rate. Now, just before the race, it's going at about 100 beats per minute. Below that is his speed, and the three bar charts at the right give an estimate of which energy supply he's depending on and how much lactic acid he's producing. There they go. The first 200 metres were the fastest part of this race, with everyone running just over 28 kilometres per hour. And you can see Brian pulling ahead there, giving them a strong lead. At this pace, they're all getting about 90% of their energy anaerobically, and that damaging lactic acid starts to build up, so they can't keep up this sort of pace for the full 800. At 200 metres, the speed drops and they bunch together, running now at about 26 kilometres per hour. You can see Brian there in third place. What's important now is for him to stop lactic acid building up, so he has to switch over and start using more aerobic energy, which means a steadier pace. But it's Kenya 1 and 2, Scotland, then Botswana, then England, England, New Zealand. 400 metres and the bell for the last lap. The speed drops back even further. They're all measuring their pace. They're keeping the lactic acid down so that they can tolerate it shooting up in a fast finish. Brian's using even more aerobic energy and managing to keep his lactic acid levels really pretty steady, which will leave him with a good margin for the final sprint. By 600 metres, his heart rate's up to 170 and the speed is creeping up again. He can build his mate around from the outside. It's a brave run. And uh, Brian Whittle's put his shoulder down, and he goes as well. And it means... 28 kilometres per hour, and they switch back to anaerobic energy. And they're all producing huge quantities of lactic acid, which slows some of them right down. But Brian's OK. He keeps going and comes in third. Horst Hornlein is watching. For 15 years, he was responsible for one of East Germany's great sporting successes, the bobsleigh team. He's the best coach in the business. He took the East Germans to a total of 13 Olympic medals. Now, though, he's training the British. The Cold War may be over, but the ice war's just begun. In international sporting competition, the East Germans used to rank right alongside the Americans and the Soviet Union. It was a matter of honour, a way of putting a half nation on the world map. And to make sure they really made their mark, they used to spend about 340 million of them every year on sport. And it made a difference. Here in Dresden, for instance, over there is the stadium of the famous Dynamo Dresden soccer team. And over there is one of the country's top schools for the selection and training of child athletes. And also in Dresden is the Flugzeugwerft, flying factory, aircraft manufacturers and bespoke bobsleigh builders. They used to repair MiGs here. Now it's just sports planes and since 1976, bobsleighs. <laughs> Thank you.
The research which produced this aerodynamic shape cost about 12 million pounds, but today only 10 people work here. These men are checking the alignment of the runners. Still, they're reputedly the best, most scientifically produced bobs in the world. Until two years ago, only the East Germans had them. Now, the British have them too. Britain's bobsleigh teams have perhaps our best chance of winning gold medals at these Olympic Games. And it's not just down to raw talent or British beef. It's because they've adopted the East German approach of why guess when you can know. To begin with, they've actually come here to train at the only indoor ice start in the world. They've bought the best equipment, the best trainer. They're applying sports science to every single detail of their performance. And now, for the sixth time this afternoon, they're practicing their starts. <laughs> the start is one of the most critical components of winning a race, and the team have videoed to check their technique. They had a biomechanical analysis done by sports scientists at the West London Institute, so they know exactly what position they ought to be in. It's just a matter of achieving it. Yeah, I think just to start off with anyway. He's only a few centimetres out, but to achieve maximum push, brakeman Lenny Paul needs to tighten his technique. But they're not just practicing their starts here. With only 36 days to go to the Olympic Games, they also have to complete general training programmes worked out for them last summer. There's go faster sprint training, and the individual athletes are also working on individual muscles. This is plyometrics, or hopping. Well, there are not just physical training programs they have to complete, there are psychological ones too. The boys have been under the supervision of a British Olympic Medical Centre psychologist. To build up team spirit, he recommends male bonding. <laughs> to encourage them to win, he dangled an Olympic gold medal before their eyes. And to make them win, he taught them the art of total recall. The first step is to walk the track and remember everything. Before each race, the driver has to select his line through the bends. What Mark Tout and Nick Phipps have been taught is to break the run down into a series of snapshots which they can recall and rehearse. It's a massive effort of concentration, but they can imagine a descent to within one-tenth of a second of the real thing. <laughs> 